One of the most scary things in the world to do is to step onto a stage and utterly be yourself. And the reason that's such a scary thing is when you march from this vulnerable place, you might be wrong. You might say something stupid and you might look like an amateur. And I'm here today to tell you that the parts of my life that have been the most successful have been when I've come from that place. I have absolutely no training in art at all. I was told repeatedly that I had no talent, that I could not draw. I graduated from Sarah Lawrence, wanted to be a writer, and I was not successful doing that either. And then I decided to take my little drawings that I had done, which I had hidden, I didn't show anybody them, I put them on t-shirts and I was selling them out of the back of my car, living on the poverty level. Everybody said that I was a complete failure. And then one day, out of the blue, someone discovered me from Takashimaya, the Japanese department store, and I became a famous celebrity designer in Japan. And I got my first, I know, I got my first children's picture book published in Japanese. And when they first met me, they said, Resri, because of course they can't say Leslie, they said, Resri, we want to make you famous in Japan. So I went from complete being squashed and rejected and then becoming famous. And what I learned through this process is that the parts of me that are the hardest to bring out into the world are the parts where we feel like we're awkward and where we're often wrong. And it started when I was a child. That's me in the green overalls. I was a normal kid. I liked to sing and dance, and I used to draw pictures. That's one of the best pieces of art I've ever created. <laughs> and I liked to make bologna ponchos for my troll dolls. <laughs> so I would take a piece of bologna, uh, bite out the middle, and make little ponchos. So I was in the clothing business from a very young age. And then my entire life changed because of Miss Pritchard. I was in the fourth grade, and I was drawing a picture in the back of the room, of the classroom, and I drew a picture of a little boy at the beach, and I put a belly button on him. And I was laughing so hard, I thought this was so funny. She saw me laughing, came and saw this offensive piece of artwork, grabbed me by the arm, took me to the front of the room, held it up, and said, don't you ever let me see you do that again, any of you in this classroom. And from that moment on, I was terrified to do any artwork at all, and I actually didn't. I then eventually started my design company many years later, but I was so squashed. What happened right after Ms. Pritchard is that Candid Camera came to my school, and they asked me if I wanted to be on television. I said, yes, great. So they take me into this back room, and they ask me this question. They say, Leslie, please tell us one of the Ten Commandments. I'm like, that has something to do with church, but I know I'm going to say the wrong thing, and I wanted to leave. Like, don't, I don't want to be on television any longer. They said, no, you must answer this question. So I blurted out the only thing I could think of, and I said, you shouldn't eat bears. <laughs> and of course, that's what they did. They laughed at me, and I was so embarrassed. I was like, I'm wrong again. Right after that, my dad took me to the local Catholic church, because I had to have a little interview to pass the First Holy Communion. And I'm sitting there with the priest, and I thought I was doing great until the very last question. He asked me, Leslie, what exercise do you do every morning and every night before you go to bed? And I'm like, what does gym class have to do with church? And then I blurted out the only thing I could think of, which was somersaults. And he laughed. <laughs> that was the wrong answer. But what I'm trying to tell you is that that core primitive self that I had this incredible creativity to me, as we get older, we start to turn into adult zombies, and we forget to plug into that core original voice where all the magic is. And in this digital world where we're so hooked up to devices, we've got these cords that hook us up. We had an original cord, which was to our mother. Our belly button went to another human being. And we have to remember that we need to ride the waves between the digital world and then this connection with the natural world. So um, these are some of the things I did in Japan. Um, all of the animals that I put on my products in Japan, everybody has a belly button. That was my revenge against Ms. Pritchard. I know, exactly. So this is, um, these are some rocks. I live in Vero Beach, Florida, and I was walking along the beach, and all of a sudden I started to notice that I was finding letters of the alphabet in rock formation. And I did a book called If Rocks Could Sing. It took me 10 years to find every letter of the alphabet. Now, who, who does this? This is, this, is, this is wrong. But it's so wrong, it's right. And people think that these rocks that I collected were actually digitally manufactured. 
they're not. They're completely natural. They're from the ocean. And if you can see on this alphabet list, I only have one letter K. And this is a really interesting metaphor for life because there was nothing I could do to make that letter K appear. I had to wait and be patient and be connected to a slower rhythm of life because the ocean was going to deliver it when it was ready to deliver it, and there was nothing I could do. And we are going so fast right now. We're always on our iPhones or on a computer. We're in this high RPM world. But if we can slow down, we can start noticing things. And I think that there's so much enchantment out there and magic if we just can slow down and take the time to find it. So these are some of the uh, things I can write. Anything with rocks now? <laughs> I have my own font. <laughs> Written in stone. There's a T is for toast. That's a rock. That's actually not a, um, it's, not a it's not a real toast. It's a rock. Let's see, this is B is for bird. All of these rocks are literally the size of half of my thumb. So they're very tiny. And I would take walks with people on the beach and I would find all these things. Nobody else was seeing anything. And I realized that the mind of the child that I've retained, I have this ability to see things that are invisible to others. And I think it's because I live expecting a miracle. I treat every single person I meet as if they might have something for me. And the same thing is true with everywhere I go. And living from this place of finding couch potatoes. Now, finding the, the couch to fit the couch potato was almost as hard as finding the actual rock. D is for dog. He's really tiny in real life. U is for up. And there's the famous K that took 10 years to find. Then I did a book called Wiggins Learns His Manners at the Four Seasons Restaurant. I was very intimidated. I have no training in art. I do not know how to draw the interiors of buildings. And I decided that I was going to have to give back my advance money because I couldn't do. I didn't know how to draw this kind of a restaurant. And then the Beverly Hills um, Billy saved me. I went to Walmart of all places, and this little voice in my head said, you need to buy this DVD set. And I'm like, what does this have to do with my life? So I come home and I put it in, and I find out that the Beverly Hillbillies were exactly what I needed to do with my book. I needed to draw badly. They were awkward, they were wrong, and they didn't try to fit in. They were utterly themselves, and it's the hardest thing to do. So I decided to just draw badly. And by drawing badly, I actually drew really well then. So that's a map of New York City. And there's the poodle with the high heels. Now, my editor called me up and said, Leslie, you have to take the high heels off the poodle. And I said, well, wait a minute, that's the funniest thing. And she said, no, but dogs don't wear high heels. And I said, dogs don't eat at the Four Seasons. The, the, the high heels are staying. I fight incredible battles like this even now to try to retain this sense of wonder and creativity that in this world we have, this kind of creativity is becoming really rare. And this is from the Museum of Bad Art. Now, these paintings that I'm showing you are so bad, they're good, because you can feel the energy of the person who created it. Lucy in the field with flowers. Hollywood lips. She's got like a palm tree growing out of her neck. Heather, come hither. You feel, you're laughing. So this means that this is great art. Who's to say, what is wrong, what is right? You have to be open to anything. The Mona Lisa. Charlie and Sheba. I don't know what that is. Is it a chipmunk? Is it a monkey? But I love the fact that someone had the incredible courage to create this piece of art. Like the, you know how scary it is to take a blank piece of paper and make something out of nothing? That is just incredibly courageous. So go to the Museum of Bad Art. It's in Western Massachusetts. So my life is all about, I think I'm fishing, but I'm catching mermaids. And I want you to leave here today remembering that that is possible and that you can paint on little pieces of rice if you want to, or you can make suits out of leaves. Creativity does not have to be just about doing paintings. And I just invite you to get out of your mind and to just live from this place of this primitive, raw, core self and when you do that, what happens is that all these miracles can happen and your life can change. And my invitation is for you to marinate in the possibility that anything is possible and that we can avoid becoming adult zombies. So take, get rid of that cord you use all the time. Remember to connect to another cord. Thank you very much. <laughs>